Again this morning, friends, we turn to God's word. And as we read earlier from 2 Samuel, uh, the beginning of David's rule as king. David had been serving his apprenticeship in many ways over the previous 10 years of his life. You know, I remember some years ago, I had to clear the home of a, a, a retired city missionary who had died. And when we were going through his papers, it was quite interesting uh, to, to just to recount his life, both as a, a working man before he became a city missionary, not that city missionaries don't work, but a, an employed man in terms of business and also his life as a city missionary. And one of the things that we find in the course of our clearing of his papers was a set of indenture papers. It was the first time I'd ever come across anything like that. And as you read through, it was a large, large piece of paper, uh, beautifully uh, scribed out. And it was between his mother, him, and his uh, employer. And on that indenture paper were the conditions under which he would be trained as an engineer. And there was also the consideration that would be paid by his mother to the, the tradesman to see his son to see her son through his three years of apprenticeship and all the conditions were written down there and Jim indeed did serve uh, and train as an engineer before receiving the call of God to mission work in Belfast. An apprenticeship is very important. Sadly today there aren't the, the, the same number of apprenticeships being offered to young people uh, as would be I ideally uh, situated. And an apprenticeship is a, is a learning process. And in many ways, that's what David had been going through. And we've been looking at that as we have moved our way through 1 Samuel. As a teenager, he was anointed king, the unlikely son of his father. And yet he was God's choice. And he was uh, anointed by Samuel. And for the next 10 years or so, he would have to run the gauntlet of Saul's resentment of the fact that he had been anointed king. Until we come here into 2 Samuel chapter 2. And we see his coronation in many ways. And he is installed as king of Judah. Those 10 years, as I've already said, was a learning time. And now the, the, the way seems clear. Saul was dead. Word came to David that Saul was dead. But even as as that word came to David, it wasn't as if he could just step into the role of king. A lot of things had to happen because the nation of Israel as such was divided. It was a, a, a nation, a combination of those tw uh, 12 tribes and each had their own distinct personality. And it was going to be David's task to bring them together. And initially, he would be simply crowned king of Judah. But the one thing, there are a number of things in this passage that I want, us, I want to draw attention to. And the first is quite simply this. God's kingdom is inaugurated by divine guidance. Verses 1 to 4 says that when David learned of Saul's death, he knew the way was opened. And he could have quite literally barged his way in and claimed his throne. But we read simply this, that he inquired of the Lord. <coughs> if anything, David had learned over the years of his apprenticeship was the fact that he had to seek God's face. We can all learn that lesson today. But as David learned that lesson, he inquired of the Lord and he asked two simple things. What shall I do and where should I go? The answer came, go up into Judah. And where shall I go? He said, go up to Hebron. Today, I want us to, to understand that it is important for all of us, even when the way seems clear and everything seems in order, that we should do something particularly in our lives, that we seek the face of God. We cannot presume that yesterday's promises must be fulfilled today. We must always seek the guidance of God and everything about everything and in all time. 
It's also worth noting this morning that David was sent to the city of Hebron in Judah. Hebron, Hebron, Hebron was about uh, 19 miles away from Jerusalem. And it was a very important town in Judah. Hebron was the town rich in, in covenant promises. It was here that Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebekah and Jacob and Leah were buried. So it held a very unique place in the hearts and minds of the people of God. And so David, with his wives, his soldiers, and his families, headed up to Hebron, and it was there that he was anointed king over the house of Judah. Here, for the first time, God's chosen king, David, begins to rule visibly on earth. As I've already said, he ruled over only one of the tribes. It was going to be his task to pull together all of the nations, all of, all of the tribes into one great nation. And here was the place that David was be, to begin. And in many ways, as, as he came up into Hebron, David was being reminded that God's promises, God's covenant promises were being fulfilled. Wasn't it to Abraham that God said, I will make of you a great nation. And through him, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You know, I wonder how often David would have gone to the tomb of Abraham and, 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 and his forebears and their wives and pondered God's promises through David's kingdom. Though David's kingdom started relatively small, it nevertheless was a, 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 a real kingdom. And God's king was ruling at this time. You know, God's kingdom is like a mustard seed, we're told. It starts small and grows into something that is really big. David's greater son, Jesus, his kingdom started small with a, a small nucleus of men called out by God. And yet that kingdom, that kingdom of God has extended across the earth. And we rejoice that today many are turning to Jesus Christ in faith and repentance. So God's kingdom is inaugurated as David seeks the guidance of God. And the second thing that I want you to note from this passage is that God's kingdom is extended by winsome appeal. Now, winsome is a word that we don't often use today, but it, there's a warmth about that word. It's a winning word. And we can recall how David, uh, from this passage, approached the inhabitants of Gabeth, Jabeth Gilead. You will remember, as we, we, we thought about the, the death of Saul last week, that the men of Jabez, Jabez Gilead went up and retrieved the body of Saul and his family and gave them a decent burial. They had done this because Saul, in a previous occasion, had rescued them and saved them from the hands of the Philistines. And so they were always uh, covenanted in many ways to Saul, and they thought well of Saul. And, and David sends messengers to them, and he, he commends them. And he says, may you be blessed by the Lord, because you showed this loyalty to Saul, your Lord, and buried him. Now may the Lord show steadfast love and faithfulness to you. And I will be good to you because you have done this thing. Now, the, therefore, he says, let your hands be strong and be valiant. For Saul, your Lord, is dead, and the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. David, in these verses, reminds us, uh, or is telling us, look, I, I, I respect you as a people. You have done great and wonderful things. I, he said, look, I, I'm going to be good to you. He said, but what I want you to do is surrender yourself in loyalty to me. That loyalty that you had for Saul, please transfer it to me. And he does this in a very winsome, winning way. And he brings a softness and a gentleness to his approach to this people who could have stood in opposition to him. You know, as I, as I thought about this, in, in many ways, it's his son, his greater son, the Lord Jesus, 
has this same winsome appeal to the hearts and minds of men and women as he extends the hope of his kingdom. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, Take my yoke upon me uh, uh, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus, when he uses that word yoke, is speaking about absolute submission. But Jesus' appeal is so winsome. He, he appeals to people to follow him on the basis of his character. Why? He says, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And on the basis of his promise, he said, you will find rest for your soul. As Jesus extended the hope of his kingdom, yes, that required total submission, we as the people of God, as we seek to win men and women for, for Jesus Christ, as we seek to share the hope of, our go of the gospel, we've got to do it in ways that men and women can see that there is hope, that there is peace, there is joy, there is life in following Jesus Christ. That it is a, a whole life experience. And it has to be seen first in us. It's not enough to stand on a, preach cor on a street corner and preach the gospel. Yes, it has its place. But if we really want to see men and women come to Jesus Christ, they've got to see it in our lives. It was C.H. Spurgeon who, who writes that he would rather see a sermon than hear one every day. He said, I would rather one would walk with me and talk with me than merely preach the way. And that's so true today. If we are to see our families, if we are to see our neighbors and our friends come to Jesus Christ, there's got to be a winsomeness about us. As David made an appeal to the people of Jabez Gilead to come and follow him, he said, follow me and I will be kind and gentle and loving to you because he respected them as people. And the third thing that I want to mention this morning is that God's kingdom is opposed by opposition. As we read in this passage, we we're told that there was a conflict that arose within the larger nation of Israel that there were those who were seeking to, uh, to gain power for themselves. David had been installed as king over Judah, but we're told that the, army, the commander of the armies of Israel, and his name is Abner, had taken Saul's son, Ishbosheth and installed him as king over Israel, as in, in direct opposition to David. Now, the chronology of this period is not entirely clear. But Abner was in control. He was a man of power. And so he, he, he decided that, well, Israel needed a king, so the best was to follow in the line of Saul. But also Abner knew that God had promised the kingship to David. And so by opposing David, Abner was opposing God and his will. Abner is simply acting like those in Jesus' parable who said, do, we do not want this man to reign over us in Luke chapter 19. David faced rebellious opposition, opposition to the kingdom of God. And the truth is that opposition to the kingdom of God continues today. And as we read through chapter 2, we see that conflict playing itself out. First of all, by uh, bringing together uh, uh, 12 men from each of, of, of the companies of, 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 of Judah and of Israel. And, and they fight themselves out and end up, all of them killed and no resolve as to which is the greater part of the kingdom. And then we see the two armies coming together. And again, there is a, a, there is a, a, a battle a, and the outcome is less than satisfactory. So much so that Abner returned with his army, having lost something like 360 men in the battle. Uh, uh, and we're told that there was an appeal 
to David for, for an end to hostility. And also we're told that there was a whole, there was a whole, there was a great loss of life and of face. And the, 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 the rebellion was mighty, was mighty. And we're told that that came to an end when Ashel was, was, buried, was buried in the tomb of his father, which was at Bethlehem. Now, we're told that Bethlehem has a significant place. In many ways, in this passage, it was the place where there was the end of uh, the cessation of the battles and opposition to David. And it was here that the, the, the real kingdom of David was beginning to be established. Bethlehem, as we know, will feature large in the story of God's unfolding kingdom. Because it was in Bethlehem that God's, uh, God's son, our savior, was brought into the world. And it was in Bethlehem that Jesus' kingdom would begin to be established. <coughs> and, and, and the story of David simply foreshadows that great event. But as we think about that this morning, let's not be discouraged when we hear of opposition, opposition to the kingdom of God, because we're told that as a consequence of opposition, we know that we have the victory. We know who's going to win ultimately, because some of us today can be discouraged when we see so many, so many uh, false religions seeking to, to gain ground. We see so many uh, organizations taking people away, but ultimately the kingdom of God will be established. And while there may be opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ, we, we, we recognize that God's kingdom will triumph, that God's kingdom will be prevail. And God's kingdom will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. But also, we also must recognize that when there is opposition to the kingdom of God, there is in fact the reality that God's kingdom is growing. Because it is a threat to Satan, to his forces and his foes. So don't be surprised when there is opposition. Don't be surprised because of persecution. The truth is God is at work in our land, in our world, and his kingdom is being extended. Friends, read through 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 2 and, 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 and let's remind ourselves and learn the lesson that David had learned that if we are to know what we are to do and where we are to go, we are to seek the guidance of God, to seek his mind and his will and his purposes for our lives. But also remind ourselves that as we live for him, we will face opposition and difficulty and that God will ultimately win, even though we may face trial and challenge today. Ultimately, the victory is God's and the gates of heaven will prevail as Satan opposes and as Satan works against the people of God. David was moving forward with his kingdom. He did so in a winsome way. Friends, if we are to be faithful to God in our day and in our generation, let our lives be living examples. Let us live winsomely for God that we might win some for him by the way that we live and act and react to the world around us.
sharing his message of hope and love. Let us pray. Gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage in 2 Samuel. We thank you for the simple lessons that it teaches. Lord, we can become embroiled in the, the detail of the passage as we see the unfolding uh, exploits of the armies of Judah and Israel and the battles that ensued. But Lord, we, we thank you that over all of this passage, we are reminded that you are King and Lord and that it's you who puts kings and kings uh, 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 upon their thrones and governments in their place. We thank you for leading and guiding David as we have read this passage. We thank you for the lessons of his life that we seek to learn, that we must be men and women seeking your, seeking your guidance. We must be men and women who live winsome lives. We must be men and women who are prepared to face the opposition with the hope that the victory is ours through Christ Jesus and that God's kingdom will prevail. Lord, we just pray that you will enable us to truly live for you in these days. Watch over us in the week that lies ahead. Guard and guide us in all that we do. And we pray, loving Father, that your grace, your mercy, and your peace will be our blessing this day and forevermore. Amen. Have a great week. God's blessing upon you.